Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, we're going to talk about confidential computing in healthcare with special guest Nick Badongi, technology specialist from AIBET. Hey, Darren. Nice to uh, chat with you on this podcast. It's been a while coming. It has. Yeah, we planned this several times, but there's always been... You're so busy right now. Yes, I'm, I'm juggling multiple projects. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a challenge getting this on the radar. Well, I am so glad that you took some time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about this really, really cool technology uh, with the very important uh, use cases surrounding it. That's right. Um, this, this is... Uh, a very keen area of interest of late. And um, I think we'll be able to uh, chat about some very interesting things that we, we can do with it, uh, especially for the healthcare sector and broadly to other sectors as well. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, what, what is, you know, why, why do we even need confidential computing? What's the, what's the whole, it sounds gimmicky to me. It does sound gimmicky, right? So let's start, let's start with a bit of, background and history. So the current computer infrastructure as we know it, uh, it's built with a premium on sharing and openness and the internet is free and data should be free. Um, That's been a bit of a problem when it comes to security. So to address that, we have for a long time, you know, implemented some pretty good solutions that do work well. We encrypt data when it's uh, stored, we encrypt data when it's in transit. We all know that. Um, but there are challenges despite that, which means that data, while it's still being read and analyzed and used, is still subject to uh, being leaked, uh, being scraped, and being uh, uh, you know, attacked in, in various ways. Um, so as more and more workloads start to run their infrastructure um, and their applications uh, in the cloud, in virtual machines, in containers, on edge devices, on IoT devices. Data is everywhere. Your applications are everywhere, and everybody's talking to everybody. So there's a big problem when it comes to uh, how, how we address the data security. Um, just encrypting data and securing the transit is not enough. Um, that's not to say that defense in depth is a bad idea but we have to go a little bit above and beyond that. So the point I'm making is sensitive data remains vulnerable, whether it's financial, medical, location data, both from a visibility standpoint and a data integrity standpoint. Now, especially with data in healthcare, there are so many rules and regulations, um, HIPAA regulations, and then there's even more. Every state seems to have something around medical as well. That's right. That adds another layer of complexity in dealing with this type of data, right? Right, so um, when we talk about confidential computing, we, we need to think about a few different factors. Uh, key there is data integrity, data confidentiality, and your code integrity. Um, and all of these are governed by different policies and uh, being able to leverage these concepts uh, of, of con- confidential computing uh, allows you the ability to, to share data amongst parties that inherently don't trust each other. Um, that's a harsh way to put it, but. Um, well, I no, I, I, like what you, I like what you said there because inherently they don't trust each other. That's right. Or maybe I don't want my cardiologist knowing what my, um, my uh, primary care physician knows and unless I sign that paper they're not going to get that information, right? So there's also a third party, me, as the, as the person that the healthcare records are about. I have a say in things too, right? You should. Uh, and oftentimes, and especially in the US, um, this is very difficult. Most people don't even have access to all their healthcare data at all. Um, it's scattered everywhere. You know, your doctor has it, your uh, specialists, whoever you, you may be seeing have it, labs and hospitals. And uh, if you try to create a picture of your own health, I'd say it's next to impossible. 
no, I, I agree. So confidential computing is supposed to break down some of those barriers for us, right? It can help. It can help by, um, first of all, ensuring that whatever data you share, you can trust that uh, it can be uh, protected in the, from a data integrity standpoint. That means it's not going to be modified by anybody. It can be confidential, which means you can um, tokenize it or encrypt it, uh, whereby the data itself does not make any sense. However, it can still be used by computation. So if you want to do analytics uh, on some data, you don't necessarily need to know the person's name or social security number or date of birth if it's not applicable to that computation. So if those, those portions of the data were uh, encrypted or tokenized in some form, uh, they can be shared as long as you trust the other party uh, and the other party can use it for analytics. Uh, but at the same time, you, know, uh, you can feel confident that whatever I'm sharing is, is not being leaked. And even if it's leaked, it's of no value to anybody. Gotcha. So this is really interesting because when I think of confidential computing, we primarily think of just encrypting data in use, but it's more than just the encryption protecting the data. It's also giving the ability to share the data with someone that you trust. Otherwise, right. there's no real value, right? Yes, and this is where things like attestation uh, play a role, whereby uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can have applications uh, you know, basically prove who they are, prove their identity, uh, and, and that attestation can be tied all the way down to the hardware level, to the trusted execution environments that the hardware provides. Um, so that way, um, you can be sure that if you're sharing a data, your, a piece of data with another application, the application itself is trustworthy. So it's not just uh, the, the transport endpoint that you're trusting, you're trusting the application and how it's going to use your data as well. All right. So with those tools in place, that could lead to some new ways of dealing with confidential data and doing like multi-party or federated learning, right? Multi-party right. learning and so, federated learning now. Right. So there are, there are two basic approaches to this. You can have an application SDK, which means that the developer of the application can decide how to partition their code into trusted and untrusted components. The other approach is to have a runtime encryption system. And, and this can be built on top of a trusted execution environment. So this approach basically involves, you know, minimizing the effort required to convert your current applications into something that can run in a trusted execution environment. So deploying full applications has its advantages because, um, you know, you can write your application and, and yet have it uh, run in a manner that guarantees the security uh, that's inherently provided by the trusted execution environment. So with a hardware-based trusted execution environment protecting your applications and data in use, it becomes very difficult for an unauthorized act actor, even if they have physical access to the hardware or root access or uh, uh, the, the hypervisor uh, to gain access to the protected application and data. So the confidential computing uh, paradigm aims to allow the removal of even the cloud provider from the trusted computing base. So that way only the hardware and the protected application itself is within the attack boundary. Okay, so, so that you, enables, min you mentioned cloud there, so this can run in the cloud, not just on that specialized is machines, right? Most cloud providers do provide uh, confidential computing environments, uh, which leverage uh, the trusted execution environments uh, uh, provided by the hardware. So it, it goes all the way down to the hardware, down to the chip. By virtue of offering these computing environments, uh, the CSPs are, uh, I think, leveraging uh, the best of what the hardware can offer and the best possible security that you can get uh, that the end user or the owner has absolute control over. So that way, you know, when you are dealing with multi-parties, each party can determine its policies and you can have hierarchies of policies. For example, you may have federal policies, state policies, local, tribal policies, and each uh, 
a provider of information can determine which policies apply and to whom. Well, that's good too, because you've decentralized now the policies as well. Correct. So when we talk about healthcare data, it, one often thinks that, hey, if I can pull all the information into this massive data lake, I can crunch it uh, till the cows come home and provide all kinds of insights. But pulling data into a data lake is far easier said than done. Um, because like we talked about, you know, just the uh, amount of privacy settings and confidentiality settings, and data sharing settings that are in place uh, amongst different levels of uh, the providers, uh, nations, states, et cetera, uh, makes it impossible. So how can we get deep insight into this collection of data that's scattered everywhere uh, across multiple devices, geographical boundaries, political boundaries of various sorts, policy boundaries, uh, and yet be able to, to do something that's, uh, that's simply not possible right now because everything is in, is in silos. And the possibility of pulling all data together to, to try and make sense of it doesn't really help. So how can we work with multi-parties uh, is a big challenge in the healthcare industry. So that's where you and I were actually worked together on this problem, didn't that's we? That's right. We've been working on this for some time. We've had some great partners uh, helping us along the way. Uh, and uh, we've, we've put together uh, what I think is a brilliantly simple architecture, uh, which allows uh, for, for this kind of use across disparate environments, uh, disparate types of data, disparate policies, and yet be able to perform centralized analyses uh, on that. Right. And I can't remember what, we came up with so many fancy names for this, but basically it's distributed confidential analytics. Yes. You can call it distributed confidential analytics, distributed multi-party confidential computing. Uh, we'll come up with a cooler name. Yeah, we'll come up. Yeah, we'll let the marketing branded. guys figure that out. Right? Yes. <laughs> As soon as I figure out how, how to monetize this, we, we can figure that out. <laughs> we'll right. give it a cool name. That's right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the use cases and the implementation, because we came up with a reference architecture using, of course, some of Intel's um, uh, hardware technology like SGX, for example, Sorry. right? That's the, that's the main crux that we built this around, but we couldn't do it ourselves. We had to do it with some third party. So let's talk about... Um, Give us an example of one of the implementations that we've, we've already rolled out on this. So um, one implementation we rolled out was a uh, small proof of concept. The idea being um, you, have, you have multiple parties. You have hospitals, clinicians, labs, uh, universities, other research environments, each with their, each with their data, each with their uh, trials that they may be running in, in a clinical um, environment um, and, um, or, or it may be uh, medical data. Uh, and uh, how can we try to analyze across this? So one use case was, can I find any correlation between people who take drug X and have condition Y when, when, when drug X has nothing to do with the treatment that's currently offered for condition Y. So for example, a diabetes drug, does it have any pro or adverse effects on people who have cancer, for example? So normally these two sets of data would not be in the same place because they are handled by very different types of providers. Uh, some may be labs, different specialists, hospitals, etc. cetera. Uh, so to be able to find something like that, if the providers were part of an ecosystem, whereby they could determine uh, at their endpoint what policies they want to apply to when it comes to sharing the data. So they may say, okay, I will share you know, data about uh, the patients who are currently in the clinical trial taking drug X. Uh, and we can tell as to, okay, what their uh, you know, condition was uh, in, in terms of uh, what's being treated, uh, how, how they came into the system, uh, and, and how many you know, doses they've had, or, or however else uh, uh, they choose to measure it. Um, so they can apply their own policies, and uh, we, can, we can have a, a centralized 
uh, application, which you can call a central research portal, um, which, which has these connections with these endpoints. And uh, you can use third-party uh, key management and attestation to, to verify each other's identities and credentials and authorizations. Um, so that way, uh, uh, all parties can trust each other. So that's one aspect of the trust. But what about the data itself? The data that's going to be pulled and uh, queried and eventually uh, transmitted, uh, we need to protect that. So one good way of doing that is to, is to uh, manage the data and the applications inside secure enclaves, which are basically a software abstraction on your trusted execution environment. And uh, these uh, uh, Encrypt, uh, encrypted enclaves or a lot encrypted enclaves. <clears throat> These uh, are confidential computing environments uh, that are provided uh, via these enclaves uh, can, can then ensure that your data uh, is handled using the policies you set. So you may, you may set that, hey, everyone's birthdays must be obfuscated or social security numbers must be obfuscated, uh, names must be obfuscated. Uh, and some other things may be completely tokenized, so they turn into complete garbage uh, for the end for the human reader, and and share that data uh, across uh, back to the central portal when a query comes in. So a, a central portal can can perform a query that spans multiple endpoints and pulls different types of data together into uh, its uh, uh, runtime system and does an analysis on that. So rather than having to go and pull everything into a data lake and then do your analysis on this, you can do this in real time. So the advantage of this is you can really do some real world evidence-based uh, research. You don't have to wait for uh, data to be published or pushed out to, you know, or, or cleansed first, right? All those policy, oh, I have to apply all my policies first before it gets pushed to the data lake and then on out. With this, it all happens dynamically and on the fly. It's on the fly, it's practically real time. Um, and uh, uh, this allows for tremendous insight. So let's take the pandemic, for example. Uh, if we had to wait every single day to get the data together and, and try to run complex analysis on it, it would be pretty hard. If we were to able to tap into live data uh, across all these different systems, you know, all over the country and the world for that matter, uh, yet be able to share it securely, uh, one could come, come up with some very unique insights that otherwise would not be uh, possible. Right, so we've already seen this in some POCs for clinician sites. But there's some other, and, and we did this with our partner Fortanix. We should mention Fortanix, right? They were, uh, they were yes, key. They've in been a great partner working with us on this. Uh, they, have, they have a tremendously uh, valuable and useful uh, product, uh, product line which, which handles all these uh, confidential computing environments, making it very easy for uh, application owners, end users, um, uh, and, and data source providers, whether they are your hospitals or uh, labs or universities or, or researchers um, to, to uh, you know, define their, their policies, their rules, um, and, and basically verify each other's identities and uh, manage keys and trusts. So they, they kind of provide that administrative part to set up these secure enclaves and, to, and to, to establish attestation between them to almost create this, I hate to use the word hive, I'm going to use it, right? Kind of this <laughs> trusted hive of endpoints that, that can now go crunch on their local data and give the results back up to the research portal. So they've got great technology that, that ties all this stuff together, which then in turn made us, you know, geniuses for all the work that <laughs> for all our, our architecture, because they already had software that did a lot of things that we needed it to do to fit our architecture. That's right. I mean, the concept of trusted execution environments has been around for some time. Uh, it's, it's gone mainstream now that, it, you know, even CSPs have embraced it. And uh, having a platform that makes it easy to leverage uh, makes it all the more powerful. And uh, 
the, the use cases for this are fantastic. So a, in other use cases, uh, it's not just the data that you want to secure. It may be the intellectual property associated with some specialized algorithms that you may have. So if those uh, models, um, so in this use case that we are talking about is um, how do you automatically detect COVID uh, from X-ray images? And uh, uh, there's data being shared, you know, there's uh, X-ray or radiological data uh, of other sorts, there's patient data. And then there's also what may be a, a unique or proprietary uh, algorithm that you want to use to do these analyses. Um, being able to protect all that, uh, uh, the, the, the enclaves offer that opportunity whereby you can do this in a, in a manner that uh, both the data and the application itself is, is secured from any prying eyes. So it secures the data as well as the algorithm or the application as well. So no one else can see that application running. Correct. I mean, because even, even if you have root access to the system, um, it is not visible to you. That's pretty cool. So I could potentially, I could potentially push down like a CNN, right? A, a mm -hmm. neural network. I could push it down into these end nodes to do analysis. And those end nodes are sitting in someone else's site and they can't see what I'm actually running in that enclave. That's correct. As, as That's long as they slick. have, as long as they have, uh, you know, agreed uh, to, to let you in, you know, as long as the trust exists and right. uh, it's been, it's been uh, set up a priority. Uh, that's, that's the way to go. And that allows you to push out, you know, new and improved algorithms all the time. And you can, you can push it out to the, to the broad world, so to speak. Uh, uh, well, to... and it, doesn't the secure enclave also protect the other machines in your network potentially too? Cause what if someone pushed, something nefarious out onto these end nodes. It would be in its secure enclave, almost quarantined, right? Correct. Anything in a secure enclave has to be, uh, you know, properly attested. Uh, the the uh, key management uh, system would verify that anything that's being exchanged with it is from who they claim to be and going to the right application. So it's the identity, it's the application, uh, and the data that are all uh, protect uh, that are all uh, sec securely attested. Uh, well, and and I also limit, I, I can limit that secure enclave to what it can access outside of the secure enclave itself. Correct. Yes, you you can you can choose exactly uh, where it's going to connect, which data data sources it's going to talk to. So I can really from. I can really lock down an enclave and isolate it from everything else in my system as well. Both, no one can get in and it can't really get out too, right? Right, uh, and, and the enclaves provide, uh, you know, all sorts of connection APIs that, that allow you to talk to, you know, files and databases uh, and uh, APIs. So that way, you know, you could have an enclave that's doing some analysis on data that's pulled from an EHR system that's hosted by, you know, let's say Cerner or Epic uh, in their own cloud, um, but yet be able to ensure that whatever data that's available to the application that's, that's, that's doing this uh, query, um, it's, it's completely secure and, and it's invisible to the outside world. That's, that's pretty cool. So let's talk, there's another use case that we've already seen and it's kind of like a mandate, right? Um, on electronic health records, which you and I both know electronic health, health records are a mess. They are. They are a, complete... they are a big mess. <laughs> and uh, uh, so there's, there's a use case uh, that's of great interest to us. And it, it may be a, a good model uh, for us to follow those, those of us in the U.S. Um, this comes from the German government. And the government actually, in their uh, bid to industry, actually mandated that... Uh, they have to deploy their applications in a trusted execution environment. And the use case that has recently been launched uh, in January of 2021 
uh, and there's more coming uh, over the next few months, is that the end user uh, through an application determines, like the end user being the patient or you know the, the, the average citizen, determines exactly what pieces of data uh, are available to, and to whom. They can, they can specify, I need my blood pressure reports to go to my primary care uh, physician, my cardiologist, and perhaps you know, uh, another pulmonary specialist that I may be seeing. Uh, so the, the level of granularity in terms of what is available to the end user um, is, uh, is tremendous here. And it's not just that. All the data that's being uh, you know, collected and shared uh, from the different systems is all running uh, in, inside secure enclaves. So that way it's, it's completely secure from the outside world. Even if anybody does get access to the data itself, it it has uh, it is completely meaningless to anybody else, and only the approved uh, uh, doctors in this case uh, would be the uh, the ones who are able to see it. So because they've been able to then go to the granularity at the electronic record level because we can do that here in the U.S. with paper, right? You everyone signs that HIPAA thing. I only want these people seeing this data, but it's on paper. And no way to enforce it. There's no way to enforce it. There's no way for you and I to know uh, if any data yeah, how has many been of those have I signed? inadvertently or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And how many of those have I signed? And I don't know who I signed them to. Or it's how many of us even bother reading it these days? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's comp it's it's a complicated mess. Um, and and we need uh, controls that are easily understandable uh, and easily enforceable. And, and these trusted execution environments are the first step in that direction, it sounds like. It, it definitely looks like it. it this, is, this is a very positive um, implementation uh, of trusted execution environments. It's very large scale. Uh, it will affect uh, all citizens in, in Germany, so roughly 75 million uh, or so. And then it's also going to uh, go into uh, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, so all those sector. prescriptions. So it's it's going to handle your prescriptions as well. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive. And um, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you can find all this information on our on our blog. There's white papers to all these uh, these use cases, and even a high level uh, white paper on the architecture that uh, this uh, confidential, collaborative, distributive analytics. Thanks for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you liked our episode, go ahead and give us five stars on your favorite podcast or video streaming site. You can also find out more on embracingdigital.com. Until next time, keep moving forward and do something wonderful.